Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from Gadigal Land. This is ABC News Daily. When China lifted its strict COVID restrictions, it was expected the economic powerhouse would surge ahead once again. But it hasn't. Instead, the Chinese economy is now in serious trouble. Today, business editor Ian Verinder on what's gone so wrong and what Beijing's woes mean for us. Ian, lots of us think of China's economy as this giant, an economic miracle that dragged millions of people out of poverty. It fueled global growth and it saved us a few times, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it has been one of the economic miracles of all time. Mm -hmm. No country in the world has ever progressed from an agrarian, rural-based, you know, essentially subsistence living Mm -hmm. into uh, an economic powerhouse, a global economic powerhouse in such a short period of time. I mean, you know, we're talking from the 60s and 70s through to to the early 2000s and now to be the second biggest economy in the world. But such rapid growth often comes at a cost. And I think those costs are starting to uh, become a little more evident now. Okay. So let's have a look in a moment at what's happening with the Chinese economy at the moment. But, you know, the Chinese, they saved us, didn't they, from the GFC? They were gobbling up our resources. It's been good for us. They've been good for us. Yeah. I mean, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, you know, Western capitalism was really on its knees. And China really did ride to the rescue throughout that period. It decided to really ramp up its global growth. And it uh, just poured huge amounts of money into infrastructure, in particular in in China and in the region as well, surrounding China. And that required enormous amounts of raw materials. And Australia, of course, was incredibly well placed to supply all of that. How did China create all this wealth, Ian? I know we talk a lot about housing in this country. What role did housing play there for the Chinese economy? Yeah, I mean, housing has been, uh, I guess, one of the uh, vital aspects of its of its economic growth, but it's been in conjunction with a massive urbanisation of the population. That required, obviously, a huge investment in housing, in infrastructure, in rail, road, bridges, mm-hmm. and all of that requires vast amounts of steel. So it, was, it became this program that just built upon itself and accelerated as it got bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, it's landed China in, a, in an extraordinary situation. Mm, The Chinese President Xi Jinping, he was speaking about this back in 2017, wasn't he, about the property market. It was a landmark speech. Yeah, indeed. On behalf of the 18th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, I will now deliver a report. It got to a point where there was a lot of property market speculation in the country and the you know, the property boom uh, turned into a massive bubble. Mm. And uh, Xi, I mean, in some ways, quite correctly, decided that this was out of control, that there was too much debt involved in it all, uh, private debt and public debt, and decided to try and rein it all in. And uh, he delivered a speech which had a, a slogan uh, that was, uh, housing is for living in, not for speculation. Not for speculation. With this in mind, we will move faster to put in place a housing system, ensure supply through multiple resources, provide housing support through multiple channels and charge those housing personnel. And it's precipitated this enormous collapse, not just in the in the property market itself, but in construction. And finally, you know, c- precipitated the collapse of the companies themselves, these massive uh, development companies that were running around the world and became some of the biggest property developers on the in the globe and they have been teetering on the brink of collapse for the past 2 years. So Ian, why is it though that the property market can't seem to make money anymore? Because they overbuilt. 
there's a huge oversupply within within China, and a lot of the construction was funded by huge amounts of debt that was unsustainable. So when they tried to shut off the debt to those companies, they stopped building new product, they stopped delivering on products for a lot of uh, buyers, and the price of real estate collapsed because Beijing said, you can't be speculating in property anymore. So there was a lot of demand that came out of the market. And so you had the developers unable to raise funding for for new developments. You had potential buyers not wanting to, or bailing out of the market because you weren't allowed to speculate. And you had this incredible supply of uh, of cities where a lot of people, a lot of cities had no nobody living there. It was just purely investment-driven speculation and no ultimate demand for it. It was all really just about ensuring that the economy grew. Wow. Okay. So things are changing dramatically and quickly. The economic miracle, it's slowing down. Yeah, it is indeed. And I mean, as an economy grows, it becomes ever increasingly difficult to maintain that kind of growth rate because mm. the bigger you get, you know, like if your economy is worth a hundred billion and it doubles to two hundred billion, that's a much bigger growth than mm. being worth one billion to ten billion. Do you mm. know what I mean? So the bigger you get, the the harder it is to maintain that growth rate, and rightly so. So everybody expected the growth rate to slow, but what we're seeing right now is uh, not just a slowdown, but potentially a really, really difficult time for the, uh, for, the, for the Chinese economy. In China's southwest, these apartment blocks are going down. Fifteen towers unfinished for seven years. The developer bankrupt. So the Chinese government, it still has a modest growth target of 5%, but what you're saying is that's not as fast as before, so the alarm bells are ringing. It means the economy is in serious trouble. But Ian, what's happening? Because the rest of the world seems to be having the opposite problem with soaring inflation. Yeah, that's the really big indicator. And and unemployment too. Youth unemployment has hit 20%. It's a real concern for Beijing. And as you just said, you know, the the goals that they've had for economic growth at uh, 5%, it's going to be very difficult for them to meet that. The most recent quarter showed a growth rate of about 0.8%. So, you know, you multiply that by four, you get to a little over 3%. So they're going to really miss that target. As you just said, the the inflation rate came in, the most recent reading was zero. Mm. And so that would give you a pretty strong indication of what is wrong in China. I mean, as you said, the rest of the world, you know, we're all been battling this inflation problem and jacking up interest rates at the fastest pace in history. And on, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got China cutting interest rates and still not being able to get inflation into any kind of growth mode. And, you know, you think, oh, well, what's wrong with no, having no inflation at all? Isn't that a good thing? And what if you know, you get deflation. What if prices start to um, go backwards? Mm. Isn't that great? Doesn't it? Doesn't that make it better for everybody? Well, no, because what happens if you want to? You know, you think you might want to buy a car or a fridge or something. Would you buy it today if you thought that in a, in a month's time it was going to be cheaper? No, you wouldn't. And so then you get this uh, snowballing effect of, of people not spending money and not investing, and that just makes the situation even worse. So deflation is a really quite worrying prospect for the for the Chinese economy. Mm, and commentary over the state of the Chinese economy is not great, is it? No. And look, we've just uh, had a Politburo meeting which described uh, the country's economic performance since reopening after the COVID lockdowns, described it as torturous. Now, that's I've never heard the Politburo describe the economy in anything other than very rosy tones. Mm-hmm. The Politburo, of course, is similar to, uh, to Moscow, is a group of high-powered individuals most of them handpicked by President Xi, to advise on uh, everything to do with running the country. 
and to, for them to admit that it's uh, that things are not good is a is a huge change in direction for for the Chinese leadership. It also omitted that phrase that we talked about just a little earlier: "Housing is for living in, not for speculation." So there does seem to be a recognition that perhaps things have gone too far. So Ian, let's have a look at what this all means for us. If China's economic miracle is really coming to an end, that's surely going to have an impact on us as well. Yeah, I mean, like you've always got to be a little careful about saying, you know, it's all going to come to an end and come to a crashing halt. Mm. I mean, China is the world's second biggest economy. It is still an industrial powerhouse, but clearly the momentum is is waning and it is going to endure some very difficult uh, times. What does it mean for us? Well, I think the resources boom that we've lived off for the last few years will definitely slow. Mm -hmm. The property sector alone accounts for something like 40% of steel demand demand within China. So if you've got a, a, a property sector that is in meltdown, uh, you know, you've got a, a large drop in demand for steel, and that means less demand for, you know, iron ore and, and metallurgical coal. So I think what we're going to see is much reduced demand for our raw materials. In some ways, you know, everyone's worried about the China's Chinese boycott of some of our uh, exports. I think it was probably quite a good thing longer term because it forced many of our exporters, particularly in wine and barley and all these other commodities, to actually look at other markets mm. and try and diversify away from one one real you know, export source of our, of our demand for our products. Mm, okay, so it's clearly not great for us. What about China though, Ian? Can it rescue itself out of this? And if it can't, what comes next? I think it's going to be very difficult for them to extract themselves from this situation. How do you get rid of debt out of the economy without having a, a massive economic slowdown? Well, you can't. So do you put more do you pump more debt into it to try and keep things ticking along? This is the the conundrum that they face, the eternal problem of, you know, if you try and fix it at one end, you you know exacerbate the problems at the other. And it is really, really difficult to fix. And I guess it's a it's a salient lesson in um what happens when you move to excess mm. and you know and the speed at which it's transformed itself is really coming back to haunt it. Mm. What about President Xi? What does it mean for his leadership, do you think? Well, you know, he might have installed himself as the permanent leader and uh, there doesn't seem to be any dispute about that, but I mean all of these things can be quite transitory, really, can't they? Mm. So what uh, what would you do if you were a, virtually a dictator in a in a very powerful nation like this? The temptation in the past, if you look through history, has been to resort to some kind of uh, military campaign. And of course, there's been a lot of saber rattling over Taiwan in recent years. So hopefully, it doesn't get to that point. But you know, I think everyone's got to be very careful with the way we behave. Ian Verinder is the ABC's business editor. This episode was produced by Nell Whitehead, Veronica App App and Sam Dunn, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Sam Hawley. To get in touch with the team, please email us on ABC News Daily at abc.net.au. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.